Hello lovely people, I'm currently existing in the liminal space between Christmas and New Year where all I have to do is relax and read and frankly it's glorious. Um, I thought I would take a little bit of time and just talk about some of the books that I have read over the Christmas period. I had saved myself three wintry books that I wanted to read over Christmas to sort of get myself in the wintry mood. The first of these was North Child by Edith Patu. Sometimes this is called East, so two different titles but they are the same book. This is based on the folktale, uh, I think it's East of the Sun, West of the Moon, which I am familiar with. So it was, e it was interesting to read this knowing the original story and seeing like what plot beats were retained and what was changed. We follow Rose and her family, and Rose's mum is very superstitious, and she believes that whatever direction um, she is facing when a child is born, that will influence the type of person that the child is. And so she sets out to create almost like a compass wheel of children, but she wants to avoid creating a North child because um, it was foretold to her that if she had a North child, they would um, leave, go on this, this very long journey, and then they would die. Obviously, she ends up having a North child, but um, she enters this fiction where they raise her believing that she is an East child, and one day this bear comes to the household, and he offers to take her away in return for saving her sister's life. And then this, the tale sort of goes from there. Um, this was definitely a really good book to get me in the wintry mood. It was very evocative. It is set um, in sort of like Scandinavia. So um, a lot of the scenery and the surrounding nature was very um, atmospheric. There's a lot of different perspectives in this. So there's Rose, there's the perspective of the bear, there's the perspective of a couple of different family members, and there's also the perspective of the Goblin Queen, who is our main antagonist within this. I thought that some of these perspectives were slightly more relevant than others. <laughs> Um, but on the whole, I did enjoy this. One thing I really enjoyed is that running throughout it, there is a theme of map making because her father is a map maker, and I really enjoyed that. And also of of textiles and weaving because Rose herself, she's a restless child, but she settles when she weaves and when she creates textiles. So those are two themes that I really enjoyed running throughout this. I think one of my sort of critiques of it is that just the nature of this tale is that it is hard to root for a relationship where one person is a bear for most of the plot because <laughs> you're like it's just a bear how are you guys communicating which is comes with the territory of this so i, I don't mean to I don't want to be unfair in that critique, it's just I think it's something that is always a challenge when you're adapting a tale of this type to make you root for a relationship where the people can't really actually communicate that well. Um, I, another critique I have of this really revolves around the figure of the mother because um, she is incredibly superstitious and this is portrayed a lot of the time in this as very silly and her mother is a figure who creates some of the problems in this text. And I just think that I would have liked it if at some point she'd been able to move beyond being silly and superstitious because um, this is engaging with fairy tales and it is developing that. But I felt like her mother was one of those characters that never really got to develop really any fuller. But on the whole, I thought this was lovely. It's a fun folk tale retelling. It's just those things stop me from being able to rate it like much higher. I also read The End of Summer by Tilly Walden. Tilly Walden is a graphic novelist who I am a big fan of. This is one of her earlier works and it was really interesting because her other novels, her other graphic novels that I've read are I like this part which is very very small and it doesn't have a lot of dialogue but I really really liked it and On a Sunbeam, which is a chunky one, but I think it is a masterful piece of queer sci-fi, and I just love it. This one I had some more mixed feelings of, although it is very intriguing. So this is, like, set in, like, a secluded castle, and, like, winter has arrived, and as such, they are shutting the doors, and then we're focusing on this family who are, like, the king and queen and their children of this place, and sort of, like, um the stiflingness of winter is affecting them and like discord arises between different family members for different reasons so there's a lot about this that i found very intriguing i think it it didn't always it wasn't always done in a way that's super delivered for me partly because the art style of this this is very early on in tilly walden's um 
Korea sometimes just wasn't differentiated enough like sometimes the faces of the characters looked so similar that it was actually quite hard to tell which character was doing what <laughs> which was um, a little frustrating because I think some of the like reveals of information were a bit muddled for me because I was like which one of the boys is this I think this is a really interesting um, portrayal of chronic illness and what it is like because our main character Lars um, is very ill and he has this giant cat that he um, rides around the palace. One thing I did really like about this is the presence of the castle. Like the castle has such a presence in this in a way that reminds me of classic gothic novels where um, there's usually like some sort of gothic building that has its own real sense of character to it and that's how I felt about the castle. There were some really beautiful um, drawings of it as well. I'm just flicking through to try and find you a good shot so like this big single page of her existing in her room and like this big page of them it was it was such an interesting setting and it kind of reminds me of like this higgledy piggledy outside of time liminal space that also has such like its own personality and presence so i really really enjoyed that so the tilly walden as an artist i love and as a storyteller i think she has some really interesting things to tell maybe this is one that on a reread i might get more out of because i might be able to pass through some of those things that i think for me felt a little bit murky my final wintry book that i was saving for this time period was on my kindle and that was catherine the great portrait of a woman by robert k massey i read this because um olive at a book olive really really rated this book because she's very big on russian history so i i feel like i will take all of her Russian history recommendations. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's a chunky book, it's like 600 and something pages, and the Kindle edition has very large text, which in some ways was a real benefit because when you're reading a chunky biography it meant I didn't get bogged down in like uh, feeling like the writing was cramped or anything. Um, I felt like this did a really great job of giving me a sense of who Catherine the Great was. It wasn't just a biography that told me what she did. It quoted quite extensively from um, her memoir, letters, writings of the time, that kind of thing. And um, I really have come away with a sense of who this woman was, what she did that made her important, but equally how she changed. Like One of the things I found most interesting is that um, so much of her life happened before she became empress and that was all fascinating but when she became empress um she had quite a a liberal and progressive view on some things like serfs and that kind of thing because she um read a lot of philosophy and she corresponded with a lot of philosophers like voltaire and stuff like this so she was very influenced by a lot of at the time quite radical thinking so she had these wishes to do some radical changes which um, became apparent that it wouldn't be possible and that kind of thing. And then as her life went on, when you get to stuff like the French Revolution happening, that then turned her into a much more conservative um, ruler because that revolution is a direct challenge of everything that gives her power. Like if you take away absolute power of a monarch, where does that leave Catherine the Great? Not very well off. <laughs> So then, almost like this flip of suddenly becoming someone who implemented censorship on printing presses and um, that kind of thing. And there were other factors that played into that as well, like um, rebellions and stuff like that that she had to quash. But um, I essentially, I just really appreciated that I, I feel like I understand um, a lot of what her core principles were and how they changed throughout her reign and what some of these key events, like her achievements that happened, but also um, the challenges she faced. like the period before she became empress, this complicated relationship w that she had with Empress Elizabeth, who is a figure that I found so fascinating because I knew Catherine the Great was this Russian empress. I didn't really know a lot about Empress Elizabeth apart from what I had read in um, Simon C. Bagmontefoy's uh, Romanov's book, which I found um, less easy to get on with than I did this one. I found this one a lot more engaging as a narrative, probably because it didn't have so many bloody footnotes in it as the Romanovs did. But um, essentially, this is very stereotypical, I saved this for winter because Russia is cold and snowy. But it did really get me in the mood, like I had quite a lot of time off over Christmas, um, and so being able to just settle down with a massive biography that I could really sink my teeth into, um, it didn't feel overwhelming at any time. Like He also has chapters where he explores contemporary, like the French Revolution, like contemporary political things that are happening and how they had an effect upon Catherine and her reign and Russia and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's on the whole, 
I thoroughly enjoyed this. I thought it was a really well done biography. Occasionally, um, I gave it a four out of five stars rather than a five stars because sometimes, like, he did repeat stuff that he'd already told me, and um, so not all of these chapters always worked as well for me as others. But I have come away with it from this with like a real enthusiasm, and I think that this is the second book in his. He's done about four books on Russian history, and I would definitely be interested in reading more of those books just to put even greater like understanding because I don't really know a lot about Russian history so this was a really great one to like sit and explore. I'm briefly going to mention a cookbook because <laughs> I count those as reading sometimes. This is Bitter Honey Recipes and Stories from the Island of Sardinia by Letitia Clark. Um, this was a Christmas present but I thought I would include this because this is recipes and stories so it's not just a recipe book there's also writings about Sardinia. It gave me a lot of understanding of um, what foods and tastes are Sardinian and the different um, areas of Sardinia. This is very much Sardinian cooking for what like a British person would have access to ingredient wise so I'm not necessarily going to say that this is the most authentic thing because she talks about that about how she is trying to translate it to like what I would have available in my supermarkets and shops but I did find it super duper interesting it has been interesting to understand what Sardinian culture is like versus my understanding of like Italian food in general and um, I'm really looking forward to cooking some of these things. <laughs> Next up is another Kindle book and that is New Sun's Original Speculative Fiction by People of Colour which is edited by Nisi Shaw. There are a whole bunch of contributors to this as with most um, collections of writings um, some of these will work for you, some of these won't. One thing I really appreciated about this anthology is there's such a breadth of writing because it's um, speculative fiction, science fiction, some of these verge a little bit more into like horror territory. Um, just the absolute range and diversity of genre and tone and style was really fun to explore even if some of them didn't always work for me. I did make a list on my phone of the ones that I particularly liked and I thought I would run through those ones specifically. So. Um, the Virtue of Unfaithful Translations by Minzu Kang was absolutely one of the ones that has really stayed with me. It's looking at this um, negotiation of this um, peace between this emperor and this um, like pirate warlord and how this was really engineered by two advisors on each side who manipulated things to make peace happen and it's this really wonderful interrogation of historical truth and what we know as historical fact and then right at the end there is a second perspective that is brought in that then challenges what the first perspective has been putting forward and is essentially telling them to go even further than how far they've gone and I just thought it was brilliant and I really enjoyed this look at who gets to write history and define history and um, even people when you return and you try and give voice to people who might not have had a voice, who are you leaving out when you do that? I just thought it was brilliant. The fine print by Janello Onwala is a brilliant look at like this idea of um, like this djinn who will give you what you wish if you enter a contract with him but what is the cost of the contract and we follow someone who is trying to get out of that deal um, and I thought that had some really nice little twists and turns and like this look at like exploitation and offers that seem too good to be true usually are. Burn the Ships by Alberta Yanez was a combination of the author's um, Jewish and Mexican um, background and it is really based on the um, when the Spanish conquistadors came to Mexico and they burnt their ships so that they couldn't return and then also the um, persecution of Jewish people in the Holocaust and it's really combining these into this sci-fi narrative that is making a real commentary and also kind of giving the opportunity for people, imagining a world where there was an opportunity to fight back in a way that the real people didn't get to have. I found that one really powerful. Three Variations on Imperial Attire by E. Lily Yu is a really interesting take on the Emperor's New Clothes that is a lot to do with playing around with narrative and the voice and I found that really fun. Um, and then finally Kelsey and the Bird and Breast by Darcy Little Badger was just really fun. We follow this girl called Kelsey and it's like this world where um, when people die their breath sometimes like this like 
kind of spirit of them doesn't always leave and her job is to go around with like her little dog spirit and sort of like round them up and send them where they need to go. I'm going to try and explore more by all of those specific authors but there were a whole bunch of others in there that were also really great it's just not all of them were like styles or genres that were my favourites but on the whole it's a collection that I would definitely recommend if you're looking to um, just discover some new science fiction speculative fiction authors that you might want to check out further. Penultimately is a reread and that is The Two Towers by J.R.R. Tolkien. Obviously December was the 20th anniversary of the um, Lord of the Rings films coming out so I have been celebrating by continuing my Lord of the Rings reread and ordering the extended edition DVDs which haven't arrived yet but I'm excited. Um, I really enjoyed this reread. I knew I was going to. I'm a little bit Tolkien trash now. <laughs> Um, essentially, The Two Towers, I know that The Lord of the Rings is essentially all one big book, but we're just going to talk about The Two Towers. The first half of the narrative, part one, is like a solid five star read for me. I love so many of the threads. I really enjoy following the Fellowship when they're split up because there are just so many aspects to this one that I love. Like, I love the Ents so much. The Ents give me such a deep, deep sadness. Like, when Truebeard is talking about how they've lost the Entwives, and, you know, there's this theme that runs throughout this, which is, like, the fading of these things that were once brilliant. And you see it a lot with the elves in Fellowship and Lothlorien, and you see it here with the Ents and these beings that are some of the earliest beings, but that have... most people don't even know they exist anymore. And the, the speech that Treebeard gives when they do the last march of the Ents gets me so hard. <laughs> so I love the Ents. I also really love Legolas and Gimli in this. Like, when Legolas is like, I'll go see all of your fancy caves with you that I'm not interested in if you come see all the fancy trees with me that I'm interested in. And they just, like, make these little plans. This book is full of boyfriends who love each other deeply. <laughs> um, the second narrative part that is Frodo and Sam and Gollum has some great moments in it that I do really, really like. I really enjoy this, the little fight that Gollum has internally, like when you get the, the glimpses of... Um, there's like a moment when Frodo has fallen asleep in Sam's lap and Sam is also falling asleep and Gollum looks at them and he softens and you get to see the creature he was before he was warped and he reaches out that hand but then Sam wakes up and then essentially has a go at him and ruins it all <laughs> which is not an insult to Sam because I love Sam but you know like this sense of who Gollum was before he became Gollum um, I really enjoy that Part of the, the aspect of that narrative is it is a journey narrative, which is what the first part is as well, but the first part has a little bit more like, we meet these things, we go to these cool places, whereas occasionally, not like a slog, but sometimes you're like, here we are, still going around some rough terrain, and I understand that that's totally necessary for what this narrative is. However, I definitely enjoy the first book of Two Towers more than the second book of Two Towers. Well, that's fine. The final book I want to talk about is another Kindle book, and that is um, School for Good and Evil by Simone Chonani, which I read on the recommendation of my work colleague, because um, I was talking about how I've been reading some, like, Arthurian stuff lately, and she mentioned that at some point in this series there's some, like, Arthurian threads that come into play, so I thought I would give it a go. I rated this one a two stars. But I also did have a fun time reading it. I think I've given it... I was, wasn't sure whether to go for like a two or three stars. So um, we follow these two people, Sophie and Agatha, and Sophie is like the perfect girl, and Agatha is like an outcast in their village. And there's this like school for good and evil, and like once a year or something, like two children are like spirited away and taken there, and then they're never seen again. And you essentially... <laughs> The reason I gave this a two star is I feel like it's trying to make some points but it also is fundamentally confused about the way that it's making them. So like the idea is that everyone thinks that Sophie's got to go to the good school and Agatha's got to go to the bad school because Sophie is beautiful and Agatha is ugly and then it's they'll go to the other schools and like the point at times it feels like the point is being made that like beauty is not goodness and ugly is not badness and that's a really great point however i feel like sometimes the ways that it is handled in this book undermines that point because it's like it's trying to make the point that beauty and ugly do not sin do not symbolize good and evil but then like when the bad people do bad things 
they become uglier and when the good people do good things they become more beautiful and it does change the way that people view them i just it also like it's just there's just stuff in here that i feel like is not really challenged like and if it was challenged slightly more i would feel like they were being more successful with the point they were making because again there's a lot of stuff to do with like how in the good school like princes and princesses like the princesses are expected to be extremely passive and faint and be saved by their princes and that is something that i expected to be more explicitly challenged because sometimes it is but then when the guy like the love interest who i really don't like <laughs> is like i'm the man and she's like then be a man rather than i don't care i'm a competent capable woman let me be in control because i know what i'm doing it's like there's just a lot of where it doesn't take things far enough i think there's a weird like they're 12 but they're all talking about like their true love and that kind of thing which is weird they should be older for sure for this narrative to work um and there's just a lot to do with like ableism that i think goes unchallenged in a way that it shouldn't at times it feels like it has the potential to be deeply queer because of the bond that these two girls have but then equally it is relentlessly heterosexual and i just found it a bit of a muddle that said it's the first book in a series. Maybe some of the other books in the series take these things and run with them in a way that makes the points that I was hoping it would make. So I don't want to like slam it fully because I haven't read the rest of the series. And you watching this who has read the rest of the series might be like screaming at your screen right now and being like, Sophie, it develops. But I don't know that because I haven't read it yet. I don't know if I am going to continue the rest of the series. I've seen some very mixed reviews on it as it continues. So I'm not sure. All of that said, I can't deny that I sped through this book and I had quite a fun time. I think it would work really well as like an anime because there are some extremely fun visuals in this, like the visuals of the two different schools and some of the things that they have to do, like some of the trials and that kind of thing. Um, I think they would be brilliant to watch on a visual medium. I just also like find myself a bit conflicted. <laughs> Um, that's it. Those are all the books I wanted to talk about. I would love to hear if you've read them, if you have thoughts on them. I would also love to hear what you read at Christmas. Did you save yourself any particular books to read? Do let me know. Um, please leave a comment down below if you fancy it. Otherwise, I hope that uh, whether you celebrate Christmas or not, that you've had a lovely little December and that it has all gone very well for you, and that um, 2022 has some brightness in store for us all. Um, that's everything I want to talk about for now. I hope you have a lovely day. I'll see you next time for something different.